My name is Pat Delahanty. I chair the Kentucky Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty, and I'm, I'm particularly happy that uh, everybody has come. I'm hoping most people in the room agree with our position, but if you don't, that's fine too. If you're, if you're not in agreement with us, at least you're here willing to listen and open to the possibility that there's another way to handle and punish those who commit very violent crimes. Ray Crone uh, was the 100th person who was freed from death row uh, in, in, the, in this country. Since, since that time, there have been uh, 38 more. And he has a, a story about how the system is, is flawed and, and, and sometimes innocent people get caught up in this. Not everyone who's innocent ends up getting freed and that's why we don't want to have a death penalty. Great. Well, it's great to see you all out there. Thank you all for coming. It's, uh, it's story time, so let's sit down and relax, be comfortable. It's uh, not meant to be a sad story. There's definitely some sadness in it, but clearly it has a happy ending because I am here right now. I'm not in death row, I'm not in prison. Um, I think I'll start out by asking you all a question. How many out there got brothers and sisters? How many ever been blamed for something your brother or sister did? much all of us have brothers. But remember what that felt like right there in your own house, your own parents, who knows you better than, than your folks, don't want to believe you, don't want to hear it, you get punished for it. Remember how you felt, the outrage, the anger, the frustration, why won't you believe me? Well, remember that, that feeling and magnify that by about 100 times and add about 10 years to it, because that's what I had to go through. And I used to support the death penalty. I wasn't rah, 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 kill them all, but I mean, me and my family just thought, well, that's for the worst of the worst. They probably deserved it, so be it. I got other stuff to worry about, other stuff to think about. And that was all I really, depth, I went into the death penalty. Of course, I had to change of mind, change of opinion after it happened to me. And really, to start my story, I got to go back where I'm from. I was born and raised in a small agricultural town, south central Pennsylvania, a little farming town where, I mean, the day you're born, you already had a reputation based on your family's last name. Everybody knew everybody. Uh, everybody helped everybody, looked out for each other in good times and bad times. I, I went to the same uh, high school my grandparents went to, went to the same church my great-grandparents went to. I was in the, the church choir, the Luther League. I played Little League baseball, Pee Wee football. I was in the Boy Scouts. Graduated in the top 15% of my high school. When I graduated, I signed up for six years in the U.S. Air Force. Got stationed in places like Texas, Mississippi, then Georgia, then Maine. Then I got sent to Phoenix, Arizona. My six years were up. I liked it out there. It was sunny and warm there all the time, just like here. I, all kind of work. I mean, the women were hot. I was 23 year old. Life was good. Got a job with the post office, bought a house. I'd never been married, never met the love of my life. All my money was mine to spend. And I had the toys. I had a Corvette, I had a four wheel drive truck. I had a sand rail, a boat. I raced stock cars, I had a dirt bike. I know for a lot of you college kids, you don't be able to relate to this, but I also found myself in bars quite a bit. As a result of me playing sports, I was on a pool league, on a dart league, I played in a softball league. All those were sponsored by a pub or a bar, you usually ended up down there afterwards. And that's where my trouble arose. The owner of a local neighborhood bar came in on a Sunday morning to open up his, his place, the CBS lounge, found the front door unlocked. He thought, hey, what's going on here? Why did my night manager lock this? And right away, he made his way over to the cash register. Now, there was the cash register standing wide open. He went through it, the money, the checks, everything appeared to be there. But he was concerned why it wasn't secure. So now he made his way right away into his office where a safe was. There was the safe in the corner. The door was closed on. As soon as he pulled on it, it opened right up. It wasn't locked. Again, he went through all the contents and everything <coughs> appeared to be there. And now he's really worried. Now he's really concerned. He's like, well, why did my night manager take care of this? He could tell that the place had been cleaned, the trash had been taken out, the bar stools were stacked on the tables. But his most important valuable asset, his money, wasn't secured away. So he made his way through, his, around through his bar, his restaurant area, and when he came to the men's bathroom there, he found his night manager, Kim and Coda, lying in a puddle of blood. All she had on was her socks. She was dead. She'd been stabbed to death. Of course, the police were called, and they initiated their investigation under the assumption that this had to be somebody that knew her, somebody that had a relationship with her. There wasn't no evidence of a break-in, no sign of a robbery. This had to be somebody that had, that had known her. So they called in the, uh, the people that worked with her, people that worked in the bar, the employees. Again, asked them, who's she seeing, who's she dating, who does she like? One of the people, one of the girls mentioned my name, said she likes a guy named Ray Crone. 
It was a couple hours later, I was at my house about half a mile away. I, I have a big Doberman, he never barked much. When he did, I paid attention. He, he started barking outside. I looked out the window and a car with two men had just pulled up in front of my neighbor's house. They got out, they were wearing suits. I went out to let my dog back in. By that time, they were walking down my driveway. I stepped out, I said, excuse me, can I help you? And one man said, are you Ray Crone? I said, yes I am, what can I do for you? He said, do you know Kim and Kona? I thought a minute, I said, no, I don't think I know anybody named Kim and Kona. He exchanged glances with the other man next to him. He said, you don't know Kim and Kona from the CBS Lounge. I said, wait a minute, I play in the volleyball team there. I shoot darts down there sometimes. There's a girl who works there named Kim. I said, I don't know her last name. <clears throat> Again, he exchanged glances with the man next to him. He said, you don't know her last name. You're a boyfriend, aren't you? I said, no, I'm not a boyfriend. What's going on here? He said, well, you're dating her, aren't you? I said, no, I'm not dating her. What is this about? And that's when he opened up his jacket, pulled out his ID badge, identified himself as a homicide detective from the Phoenix Police Department, informed me of Kim's death, said he was there to ask me a few questions. And I was stunned. I was shocked. Here's somebody I knew, vaguely acquainted to the bar. The police were there to ask me about her murder. First thing I said was, sure, come on inside. I invited him into my house. He said, no, we need to do this downtown. They put me in a black and white police car, drove me down to the police station, put me in a little small interrogation room, and for the next three hours, grilled me about how long we've been dating, where we go on dates, how many times we've been over to my house, where we go out to dinner. All the while, I'm telling him we've never been out. I'd go to the bar sometimes, I'd see her there, that was it. During this three hours, at one point, he had me take my sneakers off, passed them out to an officer, I got them back later on. Another point, he had me take my shirt off, took pictures of my upper torso, took me in a room, took fingerprints and mug shots of me, all the while going back to this boyfriend-girlfriend scenario that he believed. I cooperated through it. At one point, even he had a piece of styrofoam that comes off those insulated coffee cups. There was actually two of them taped together. Had me bite into it. I didn't know what it was about. There was nothing in the news. Or he wasn't feeding me in for any information about the crime. Just asking me to do these things. After three hours, I was taken home. I thought that was the end of it. I didn't kill her. I don't know where her friends or why anybody would kill her. I was home in bed. I got a roommate that knows I was home in bed. But that wasn't the end of it. The next day was a, was a Monday. I went to work that day. I got home from the post office. There was the detective waiting in my house. He said, well, Mr. Crone, I don't think you've been completely truthful. He said, I want to eliminate you as a suspect. You want to cooperate, don't you? I said, well, sure. What do you need me to do? He said, well, I need you to come downtown. He said, I've got a few more questions for you. This time I got in his own marked police, own marked police car, got in his own little detective car, and down we went to that same room, that same interrogation room. Only this time, as soon as I stepped inside, he slammed the door behind me, pulled out this piece of paper, said, oh yeah, and by the way, I have a search warrant here. And you're gonna give me a blood sample, a hair sample, and a cast to your teeth. He's got this held up, and I get it from him, I read over it, it's signed by the judge, so ordered me to do this, so at the bottom it says they have three hours to do it. And I'm a little aggravated, I'm a little angry. I'm down here cooperating, and all of a sudden he's getting a little testy, a little aggressive with me, and all I did was volunteer to come down and help him. But I cooperated. I cooperated when they took blood out of both arms. I'm not sure he realized it was the same blood. He actually struck me in both arms. <laughs> I cooperated next when they took a hair sample. And they don't take a hair sample with scissors. They pull it out by the roots from all over your body for the little envelopes. I cooperated through that. Then they took me next door and put me in a bigger room where they had a dentist chair set up. Had a dentist in there, sat me down in this chair, had this metal cast they filled up with goop, jammed it in my mouth, took two casts of my upper teeth, then two casts of the lower teeth. They put this plastic apparatus in my mouth with cameras rolling, and having me snarl and grin and move my chin around. And all the while, I was telling the history of my dentition, the history of my teeth. Back when I was about 18 years old, I was a pastor in a head-on collision. I woke up in the hospital the next day. My mouth was wired shut. I had a broken jaw. Six weeks went by, the wires came off. I'm all excited. It turns out the bottom jaw and the top jaw don't line up. They have to re-break the jaw, wire shut for another six weeks. When those wires finally came off, now I have some gum problems, I had some teeth in the diet, I had to get some root canals, I had to get some, some permanent bridges. Fifteen years later, it wasn't straight and even anymore. And I was careful with my teeth. I didn't bite into corn or the cob, out apples. And here they were poking around in my mouth for two and a half hours. I was finally over, the detective took me next door back into that little interrogation room, sat me down at the table. All of a sudden he bangs at the table and said, look, it's time to come clean, it's time to tell the truth. I know you did it, why don't you just confess so we can all go home? Now that was about enough for me. I mean, my honor, my integrity was something I was always proud of, something my friends and family recognized in me. I was 35 years old at the time. 
Certainly my honor, my integrity must have meant something to U.S. Air Force. I had a top secret clearance when I worked there. Certainly must have meant something to U.S. Postal Service that hired me as a letter carrier, handling people's personal property, their mail, walking in and out of their homes. And there's a man that doesn't even know me, calls me a murderer, a rapist, tells me to confess. I came up out of my chair. I told him what I thought of him, what I thought of the police department, what I thought of the investigation. I said, why are you wasting my time? Why don't you go find the person who did this? And by the way, your three hours are up. He looked at the watch, he looked back at me, he said, look, I'm not going to argue with you. There's other ways to handle this. And he took me home. I never said another word, just took me home. And I was happy because by then it was like 9.30. I was there for like three and a half hours. I was pretty angry. Well, I found out what he meant by other ways to handle this the next day. It was December 31st, 1991, New Year's Eve. Four o'clock in the afternoon, I just pulled into my driveway after my working at the post office that day. Just getting out of my car, all of a sudden I hear the screech of brakes, these doors slamming, people yelling, freeze, don't move, you're under arrest. I look over my shoulder, there's a band load of police officers, full ride gear, guns drawn, bail on me, throw me on the ground, handcuff me and arrest me for murder, kidnapping, and sexual assault, and Kim's dead. I was taken to the Maricopa County Jail, it's about to, it's there in Phoenix, it's about the fourth or fifth largest jail in the U.S. Some of you might have heard of the self-proclaimed toughest sheriff in America, made us wear pink underwear. Uh, surface green maloney for lunch, had a chain gang for women, a tent city out in the desert for the inmates out in the heat. That's where I went. I've never been in jail, I've never been in prison. I didn't even have detention in high school. It might make me sound a little lame, a little nerdy, but I mean, you didn't go to your wrestling coach and say, Coach, I got detention tonight. You can just imagine the extra calisthenics running up and down the steps is going to involve because of that. And I knew right away I was around a whole bunch of people I was not going to like. That actually included the inmates, to tell you the truth. <coughs> but you know what I thought about them the first couple minutes and the first couple hours? Man, did I lock my car? Who's feeding my dog? I got a big softball tournament this weekend. They need me to pitch. As you see, I was stupid. I was naive. I actually believed the police were out there continuing their investigation, going to find out that everything I told them was the truth, and they'll be out here, and they'll be coming to get me, tell me to roll up and go home. Any minute now, and then any hour now, and then and it got to be day now, and then week. I was in there a couple weeks. I told my family right away not to worry. I didn't do it, and you know, I was, uh, you know, this will all be, be be straightened out real soon. And they believed me. They knew me. I didn't have to tell them twice. Some of my friends there in Phoenix realized after a couple of weeks I'm still in there. That some of the new attorneys would send an attorney in to talk to me. Of course, the first thing I would know is how much this is going to cost me. He say, well, you're looking at a $15,000 retainer, probably another eighty dollars to $100,000 in expenses. I'm like, wait a minute, let me get this right. I make $30,000 a year at the post office. I bought a house seven years ago for $50,000. You're telling me I need to come up with $100,000 to pay you to defend me for something I didn't do, and I'm not going to get that money back? I said, yes, Mr. Trone, that's about how it works. I said, look, I'll be fine. I don't, I don't need any attorney. I said, I'm going to be out here any day anyway. I didn't do it. Well, about a month and a half went by, I finally got out to a legal visit. There was a lady come in, set a briefcase down, picked up the phone, I picked up my side, and introduced herself as a public defender there to represent me. Then she said, you've been charged with murder, kidnapping, and sexual assault. You can expect to be found guilty, but we'll find it on appeal. And I went crazy. What do you mean I'll be found guilty? I'm not doing this while I'm still in there. I just started going off. She got the phone held away from her, got her hand held up, got me quieted down, found it. She said, listen, I'm going to tell you something, Mr. Crone. I'll take that tone of voice from the judge. I'll take it from the prosecutor. I'm certainly not going to take it from you. Hung the phone up, picked up a briefcase and left. It's the last I ever seen her. A couple weeks went by, I got some paperwork saying that the public defender's office was being removed from my case. They cited a conflict of interest. They said the next most likely suspect in this murder was the victim's ex-husband. Uh, they had, a, they had a, a couple children together. Their oldest daughter had a sleepover at his house. She was like 15. He did something inappropriate with one of the little girls there, was arrested for it, was being represented by the public defender's office. When I was being turned over, I was going to be, I was going to be given a court-appointed attorney. I went before a judge with a private attorney. I thought, good, now I've got to get somebody to do something, get me out of here. Well, maybe he was a good attorney, maybe he could have been a good attorney, but that day when I was in the courtroom and this man was appointed to represent me, right after that, the judge granted him $5,000 payment to do it. He was going to get paid $5,000 to represent me in a capital murder case. You can't even get a divorce for $5,000. I got what they paid him for. I got no representation. He didn't do any investigation. He wanted me to take a plea bargain. I told him what to do with that. 
Just seven months after the Kim's body was found, I'm sitting in trial with capital murder case. Just seven months. And I found out why they had me bite in that piece of styrofoam. Why they had that dentist there the next day. You see, I wasn't there and I didn't kill him. And they had footprints that didn't match me, fingerprints they couldn't link to me, hair they couldn't link to me. So the prosecutor hired a bite mark expert. Let me put that in quotation marks. The prosecutor hired a bite mark expert who testified that the marks in the body matched my teeth, that my teeth were unique as a result of that car accident, that those marks were made at the time of her death. So that made me rape prone to murder. The man was very well spoken, very pressy, very powerful, very convincing. Also, we later found out very well paid. Turned out the prosecution paid him over $50,000 for his work in my case. Ten times when I got to defend myself. The trial lasted just three and a half days. Three days were pretty much just the police, the detectives, and the bite mark expert laying the groundwork. And then it came the defense's turn. <coughs> I took the stand, raised my right hand, testified, answered my attorney's questions. That prosecutor came up then to cross-examine me. Started writing, said, so you deny killing Kim and Kona? Yes, I do. So you deny being at the CBS lounge? Which night, I said. He said, well, the night of the murder, of course, Mr. Cronin. Are you going to be argumenting? You know you're on trial here? He just started going off. Just, it was an argument for two hours after that. I'm telling you, when I came down off that witness stand, I was like so confused, so disoriented, I almost went over and laid down next to him like a dog. My roommate was next to take the stand. He was living at my house at the time. He was going through a divorce. Almost his whole paycheck was going to, for child support. He got on the stand, raised his right hand to testify to tell the truth, answered my attorney's questions, and here come that prosecutor up again to cross-examine him. Stood there in front of him for a minute and said, now you've known Ray Crowe a long time, haven't you? My friend Steve said, yes, that's right. It's been 12 years now since we were in the Air Force together. And the prosecutor said, and, and Ray Crowe's always been a good friend to you, always been there in times of need, times of trouble, looked out for you, helped you out. In fact, he's even given you a place to live right now, isn't he? My friend kind of straightened up and said, yes, that's right, this kind of guy Ray is. And the prosecutor leaned over and said, you'd lie for him, wouldn't you? Turned and walked away and sat down. <clears throat> that's how he cross-examined my friend right there in that court of law, a friend who raised his right hand to tell the truth, a friend who raised the same right hand to you know, swear into the U.S. Air Force, and that's the minute's time that prosecutor called him a liar, said you can't believe him, he's going to lie to protect his friend. The jury was out for just three and a half hours. Came back and found me guilty of murder and kidnapping. They acquitted me of the sexual assault. I can't really explain that. It doesn't make much sense. Uh, prosecution's theory, the motive, he said, was I went there at closing time, uh, helped her close up. She refused me sex. I forced myself on her, realized what I'd done, and then had to kill her to silence her. That's why I said I killed Kim and Kona. And the jury just acquitted me of sexual assault. Four months later, I'm back before the judge. In Arizona at that time, the jury only handled the guilt phase. Then they were dismissed, and then the judge handled the sentencing phase. And they have a little mini trial. It's called an aggravating mitigating hearing. The first part's by the prosecutor. This is where they put on the aggravating part. This is where they argue why this is above and beyond the norm. So outrageous, so horrible that it merits the death penalty. It deserves an execution for it. And the bottom prosecutor argued the bite mark. He said this bite mark must have happened just prior to she lost consciousness while she was still awake. Excruciatingly painful, excessive pain and suffering that she went through. This bite mark was on her breast. Or he said it was just after she was already dead, after she was already, you know, it was like necrophilia, it was tampering with a dead body. That's just heinous and depraved. The judge ruled that that was an aggravating factor. They have to find at least one aggravating factor in order to get a death sentence. But then it's the defense's turn to put on the mitigate. Mitigating means to lessen, to abate, to ease, to soften, to explain, to some people will say make excuses. Normal mitigating factors may be a drug or alcohol impairment, a history of drug and alcohol abuse, a history of mental abuse, a history of physical abuse. That's the normal mitigating factors. I want you to think about something for a second. How do you mitigate something you didn't do? How do you show remorse or regret for an act you never committed? That's what they wanted me to do. They wanted me to apologize, beg for my life, say I was sorry. I told my attorney, I got nothing to mitigate. I said, I didn't do it. He said, well, we'll put your family, your friends on, get up there and testify to your good character, your good behavior. I said, you're not putting my mom, my sister in that stand and have them cross-examined by that prosecutor. No way. He said, well, you're going to tell the judge that. So I told the judge. I got no remorse, Your Honor. You got the wrong person. I didn't do it. 
So I was labeled a cold-hearted killer, an unremarkable monster, and sentenced to death. A person that don't deserve to live. Chained up, taken away to the to death row in, in Arizona. I was put in a cell the size of most of y'all's bathroom at home, six by eight, cinder block walls on three sides, steel bars and a sliding steel door in the front. That, that door had a trap about this big, we called it a trap, it was an open hole, that's where they fed you through. And you better be there when they brought the trays because it fell inside and fell on the floor. It's like, oh well, sorry about your luck, they just look at you funny. I never got a hot meal ever in death row, never. Because they don't let people in death row work in the kitchen. By God, no, we're monsters, we're animals. All the weapons that would be in there, somebody will die. You know, our food was prepared on the minimum yard. It was put in carts and wheeled over and sat in the hallways, and they just waited to feed us whenever they felt like it. And that was my new home. Cement slab on the floor, just poured right into the floor. Had a cement slab that came out of the wall. There was a table. There was another blob there on the floor, cement blob. That was my seat, and in the corner was a stainless steel sink commode combination. I got one army blanket, one sheet, one towel. I wrapped the towel around my sneakers. That was my pillow tonight. This is where I was to live until they executed me or until I got a new trial. And I beat myself up those first couple nights, you know, how to sleep. Why me? What did I do to deserve this? I mean, I was the guy you could call in the middle of the night and come out and get you if you were broken down somewhere. I'm the one who loaned you money. I'm the one you could trust with your girlfriend, take to the airport or whatever, stay the night. Why me? My folks, friends still were behind me, still believed in me. They were horrified at what happened, but they were still believing me. And my family sent in the Bible. I, started reuniting with my faith, uh, reading that Bible, I found strength in the stories of like Job and Jonah, and passages, out of the darkness shall come to light, rejoice in trials and tribulations, for you shall find favor in the sight of the Lord. Kind of got my strength back, if you will, my, my head a little bit out of the depression. I realized, if I'm going to fight this system, I better know this system. So I started going to the law library, started reading the law books, studying up. I was up there so often, in fact, they ended up offering me a job to work in the law library. One of only four death row inmates out of 122 of us, I believe it was at that time, that were uh, allowed to work up there. And before that, I only got out of my cell three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. That was rec day. Officer would come to your cell, and you just strip down in front, of everything off of you, pass it out through that hole, you pat it down, check your shoes, everything to make sure you weren't hiding anything anywhere. Then you'd have to lift and twist and bend and turn right there in front of you to make sure you weren't hiding anything anywhere on your body. You pass those clothes back into you, you get dressed right there in front of you, stick your hand out through that trap and put a pair of handcuffs on you had a leather belt attached. Turn around and you be fastened at the back of your back so you couldn't move your hands any farther than this. You motion the other officer that's outside the cell block looking in the window to open up your cell door. You take one step out away from your door, turn and take one step away from the officer and freeze. And it better be one step and only one step, and it better be in those directions. Because if not, they considered either attempted escape or assault on staff. He grabbed that belt, kicked the legs out from under you, and bounced your head off everything he could find. And they like to do that to some people. But you'd stand there and you'd freeze while he pat you down again to make sure you didn't hide anything in the last minute while you just got dressed right in front of him. They put an 18-inch chain around your ankles, big master lock on each ankle. Called out to clear the pot, dead man walking, nobody else would be allowed out except, except one inmate. Another guard would come in, the two guards and me would be escorted outside, down the steps, out the hallway, outside into the desert where they had a 10-foot square cement slab, had hurricane fencing around it, 10-foot high, fence across the top, and I was put in there for the next two hours. That was my vacation, that was my little bit of enjoyment there. I got outside of myself for a little bit. Got outside to feel the sun on my skin, maybe see an airplane fly over, maybe a bird. Maybe hear a car horn honk, a motorcycle engine, a lawnmower, a dog bark, anything to remind me that I was still a human being, that I was still alive, and it wasn't just pinned up inside a cell block. Well, while I was surviving here on death row, my case was making its way through the Arizona Supreme Court. Most states, any time you get sentenced to death, the case goes right to the director of that state Supreme Court, and they review it for technical, technical legal issues, not the evidence, not. Was it admissible? Was it done according to law? And I have to say, God bless my worthless attorney because he actually did have a good day in court. The day before my trial started, my trial was to start on a Monday. That Friday, I was uh, called out to the judges to the, to the courtroom there, and the prosecution was wanted to introduce a videotape made by their bite mark expert. Real impressive, 70, or about 45 minutes of how he matched my teeth to this bite mark. 
My attorney is awake. He was actually paying attention at the time. He objected to the admission of this videotape. Judge says, denied. I'm going to allow this tape in. And then a burst of brilliance, probably never again recreated my attorney's career. He said, Your Honor, in light of that ruling, I'm going to need 30 days to continue it so that I can prepare for this videotape. Judge says, denied, overruled. We need to get this trial rolling. Now, this judge would never rule in our favor in anything, really. I mean, he was an ex-prosecutor responsible for half a dozen people already on Arizona's death row. He says he's got to get this trial rolling. Seven months after they found the body, he's got to get the trial rolling. But when the Arizona Supreme Court reviewed this issue, they recognized it for what it was. It was a violation of the rules of discovery. As a defendant, you have a right to know what evidence is going to be used against you. You have a right to receive it in a timely manner so you can prepare your defense. They're not supposed to drop it on you last minute. They're not supposed to surprise you with it. They're not supposed to hide it or destroy it from you. They said the judge was wrong. But just because there's an error and omission a mistake made does not mean you automatically get a new trial. It doesn't mean you walk free. There's two parts to it. The second part is called harmless error evaluation. This is where they review this mistake, this omission, this error, determine whether or not it would have affected the verdict. Did it matter? Would they have cared? If not, they say it's harmless error, you know, the fear expands. Well, in my case, the Arizona Supreme Court's exact words were, without this videotape, there wasn't even a jury submissible case against Mr. Crone. They recognized everything was about a bite mark, that this was key evidence. And so they ordered a new trial. Of course, they're being on death row, and hearing that, you can imagine how good news that was for me and my family heard about it. But by then, I've been on death row almost three years. They executed people while I was there. My family and me both realized the state of Arizona could, would, could and would kill you and didn't care if you were guilty or innocent. They were just making sure their books was clear that their uh, careers <coughs> continued. And as uh, those number of people that I've seen executed, some of the people that I know, I've seen them being walked out, being taken to an isolation cell where they sat for another week. So the state could watch and make sure they didn't kill themselves before they deprived the state of executing them. But I can tell you this, one of them guys ever drug out of there crying and kicking and screaming, saying, no, no, I want to live, don't kill me. No, in order for us to survive on death row, it's like, kill me, do me a favor. Take me out of this hell. Dying ain't hard, just living there was what it was. Living in those conditions was what's hard. Dying's easy. Get me out of this. When nobody kicking and screaming. Well, my folks mortgaged their house and cashed in their retirement funds. Anything they could do so they could hire an attorney for me because they realized how serious this was. It wasn't going to be like those first couple of days when I was arrested saying, oh, I'll go away. I didn't do anything. We got an attorney out of Southern California. We couldn't come nowhere near the hundreds of thousands of dollars it would take for a good attorney. But he was familiar with my case. He said, look, let me handle this. Just pay the expenses. That trial started in February of 1996. It lasted six and a half weeks. Over 500 exhibits were introduced. Almost 30 experts testified. Three bite mark experts testified for the defense. My folks took off from back home and came out and sat in that courtroom each day. My sister was there. Friends there in Phoenix would get off work early, take days off on special days just to come in there and be in that courtroom. The little local newspaper back home sent a reporter out, covered the hall every day. And the truth was coming out and was feeling good. This attorney had done his job, done his work. He found out he had a book that uh, was supposed to be the police reports. Supposed to be in chronological and numerical order. It's supposed to be it go from 20 to 37, skip from 42 to 51 and stuff. There was big gaps, pieces missing. He petitioned the judge to get all the reports, every one of them. The prosecution finally produced them. Charged us $700, copying fees, they said. We asked for all the photographs, all the pictures taken at the crime scene. We originally had a stack that was about as big as maybe a double deck of cards. Asked for all the pictures. I had to go through the judge. The judge finally got it for us. <coughs> Almost the size of a shoebox. They charged us $1,400. Copying fees, they said. I thought as a defendant, you have a right to that kind of stuff. But see, they knew that my family and me were bankrolling, that we were, it was our money. And we didn't have any money. I didn't have any money. That my folks were just blue collar workers, <coughs> stay at home mom. But he realized this was costing us money, so they charged us for everything they could. But still, they couldn't dampen our spirits because the truth was coming out. Found out that they had actually taken a swab from the bite mark on her breast where, they, where this bite mark I'm supposed to name was. And they identified it as a saliva sample. 
and they did DNA testing on it. And that saliva was no way, no how my DNA. It did not match. Can you kind of imagine how that was that day in the courtroom to hear that testimony, to hear that being said, ah, finally the truth. See, I still didn't get it. I still didn't realize. Death penalty case is the most important case the prosecution can ever handle. These are the cases you better win at all costs. This is how you climb the career ladder. This is how you, how you become attorney generals and, and governors, if you will. You better get a conviction if you're doing a capital murder case. The hardest case, the most important case in their career. You don't go to any lengths to get that conviction. I'll tell you how far my prosecutor is willing to go. Prosecutor is the last person who gets to address the jury before they go out to deliberate. He has the very last word. That prosecutor stood in front of that jury, this was in 1996, said you can disregard that DNA, ignore that DNA, it's meaningless, it has nothing to do with this crime. He said, don't let the defense mislead you. That's all they've been trying to do this whole trial. You as a jurist was responsible to see that justice is done for Kim and her family. He said, that DNA, that DNA is easy to explain. She's a waitress. She handles glasses and bottles all day long. That was just transferred there by accident off of somebody else's glass. Jury was out for three and a half days. Came back and found me guilty again. As bad as it was the first time, the first time I wasn't expecting it because the first time I believed in the system and felt nothing could happen, I didn't do anything. By this time, the second trial is I knew something could happen and it would happen and they'd do whatever they could. But there I was, I sat through that trial, harmless there, I mean, reasonable doubt, all this stuff. It's like, how could they do this? You know, and I look over the jury, they're wiping the tears out of their eyes. And this is her just tearing me up. The jury's wiping the tears out of their eyes. The bailiff is reading the verdict off, the voice is breaking up, he can't hardly read it anymore. My big attorney's hanging on my shoulder saying, oh my God, Ray, I can't believe this, why didn't they pay attention? I don't understand, he said, but it's not over, I'm with you till the end. And I look over at the prosecution's table, they're all jumping up and down, high-fiving like they just won the big game. I'm thinking, whoa, back up, rewind this. This didn't happen. This, you know, go now start over. Come on, let's do this right here. You didn't mean that, did you? Oh, no, it hurt to, to see that. But that's not what almost killed me, not, not what almost made me die right there. What hurt, what really hurt was when they said guilty, and they hear this most horrible scream, this wail, this cry from my mom and sister, not five feet behind me, to turn around and look in their eyes and see that horror. I say, Mom, Amy, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. Don't worry. I'll be all right. I'll be okay. It'll be all right, Mom. Oh, that's what tore me up. They weren't just doing it to me, they were doing it to my family. Five months later, I'm before the judge again. Same as the first time, the prosecution used the bite mark, found an aggravating factor. Came the defense attorney, to put on the mitigating. I told my attorney, I got nothing to mitigate. He said, you let me handle this. What a good attorney does, what a person in any career field doesn't quit, doesn't take shortcuts, does the most and the best that he can or she can. He said, you let me handle this. For the next two hours, he went over all the piece of evidence that came out at that trial that pointed to someone else. Why footprints in the kitchen where the murder weapon, a big butcher knife, was taken from? Well, Mexican towel floor. Same footprints on the same towel floor in the men's bathroom where Kim's body was found. Footprints that they used some kind of magic dust and a black light and actually got a perfect picture of these shoe prints. Went and bought the shoe to match. A size nine and a half Converse. I wear a size 11. My bare foot was bigger than the whole shoe print. <laughs> Why palm prints, fingerprints found in the sink in the men's bathroom, on the paper towel dispenser, on the trash can. Why these prints, none of them matched me. This is where the knife was washed and dried and hidden underneath the liner of that trash can. None of those prints found there matched me. Why DNA from the body, hair found in the body, did not match me. When he was done, the judge said that this case was going to haunt him for the rest of his life. It was hard for him to believe that somebody like me that could have committed this crime be faced with death sentence. It's even harder for him to believe he said that somebody like me did not commit this and was now sitting here in judgment for something I didn't do. He said he had lingering residual doubt of my guilt. He wasn't sure that I did it. He said that mitigating factor outweighed the aggravating factor. So he sent me to 25 to life instead of to murder. Well, Pete, thank you very much. Pretty, pretty generous, right? Then he went on to aggravate the kidnapping, sent me to 21 more for that. Man consecutive. 25 for the murder, 21 more for the kidnapping, you add that together. 46 years I was facing minimum before I had my first chance of parole. 46 years. I was 35 when this happened. You had those two together. Yeah, I was going to live to be 81 in prison. <laughs> nah, wasn't going to happen. 
It was a death sentence. I just wasn't going to be laid on a, on a gurney having a lethal cocktail shot into my veins in the name of the good people of the state of Arizona. I was going to die for one reason or another, natural causes or, or shank or healthy reasons. But I was going to die in prison. You know, prisons are very violent, very racist. They are segregated. They are gang controlled. I've been in my share of fights. It's happened a number of times. It's just the way it is in there. You have to survive. But even the medical conditions are outrageous. I had a broken arm for four days. My family refused to go to work. It was already, it was past black and blue. It was now purple and orange and yellow. My family refused to work. They come, got the goon squad, drug me out of there. They finally took me to medical. I had a broken arm for four days. But even something as simple as a toothache, I got cavity. I lost Philip. I got one remedy and only one remedy. <coughs> pull the tooth out. Just pull it right out. It's gone. I was supposed to survive for 46 more years in there. But my family and friends are still standing behind me. I'm still reading the Bible. In those days, you learned to kind of flatline your emotions. You didn't get too excited about good news. You didn't get too depressed about bad news. It's one or the other seemed to be around the corner the next day. And I've seen in the paper people getting released or seen on the news people getting released because of DNA and I kind of had mixed emotions about it. First I think, yeah, right on, because that could be me one day. I'm innocent too. And I think, yeah, on the other hand, it's like a lot of good DNA did me. And I'm thinking I went eight years go by, still surviving there, my family's still fighting. My appeal gets turned down. They said it was a trial, it was a fair trial. I had no appeal, nothing to appeal. I think that I've been dying here, can you believe this? It's the friends and families and lawyers didn't give up on me. Finally, in 2001, the Arizona State Legislature has passed a new law, a law that allowed an inmate's previously untested DNA material to get that material tested if it had direct bearing on your guilt or innocence. And the police had kept Kim's pants and underwear had been cut off for her and thrown in the court of the men's bathroom. They had saved that, preserved that. And we were able to get a judge to have DNA testing done on that pants and that underwear. Of course, the prosecution showed up, the Attorney General's office showed up, said it was a wild goose chase, it was a fishing expedition, it was a waste of the court's time and money. They pleaded with the judge not to grant this motion. They said Crohn's been convicted twice of a jury of his peers, overwhelming evidence of his guilt, Your Honor. Don't grant this motion. But the judge did order that testing to be done. Then he went on to order the Phoenix Police Department's recently accredited DNA lab to do that testing. After a while, I've been through the last people in the world I want to touch anything was the Phoenix Police Department. I mean, my family didn't trust them, not one bit. But again, as funny a world it is, I was actually, actually very fortunate they did. Because see, law enforcement agencies are the only people that had access to the nationwide DNA data bank. Just like fingerprint information was being stored all over the country, being accessible through a, a, a computer, <coughs> DNA was now being stored from all around the country. <coughs> so when this lab technician found this DNA on her pants or her underwear, it was the same DNA on both, both pieces of clothing. Compared it to me, and it wasn't me. Compared it to Kim, compared it to the victim, it wasn't her. And I have to say, God bless this overachiever. Because this lab technician decided on her own, this was, that was all that was required by the court orders just to compare it to us too. On her own, she decided to take that DNA sample and put it in the nationwide DNA data bank, which happened to be right there next to her. <laughs> and came back with a match. Came back with a match to a man that right then in 2001 was serving a 10 year sentence for having sexually assaulted a child just a few weeks after the murder. The man was on parole at the time of the murder for another sexual assault four years earlier, was paroled to his mom's house, whose address was right behind the bar in Phoenix, Arizona. Of all the people, all the people in the US, this DNA matched somebody who was right there by the bar. My investigator got the man's name, went down to the yard. He was three months from being released. His name was Kenneth Phillips. He was an American Indian. Had a history of drug and alcohol abuse. Had a history of being abused as a child. He had a tough childhood. We were able to question him. My investigator was able to get in and talk to him. He denied everything. He said he'd never been in the bar, didn't know anything about it. My investigator was ex-homicide detective from San Diego. I uh, had 30 years experience. He continued to question him. Finally, Mr. Phillips admitted that, that he remembered being in the bar. I remember getting an argument over the bathroom. He said he had a blackout. He didn't remember much more. And then he remembered waking up the next day covered in blood, wondering, my God, what did I do? Now, this was tape recorded. It's called admission of guilt. He didn't say, I killed her. He didn't confess, but he admitted the elements of the crime. So with this tape recording, this admission of guilt with the DNA results, they went to the prosecutor's office, put it on his table, said, let Ray Cook go. He's innocent. Here's the proof. You know what my prosecutor said? He ain't going anywhere. We know he did it. We got the bite mark evidence. 
<laughs> didn't care one bit about the truth. Didn't care one bit about me. That case was closed as far as he was concerned. Fortunately for me, somebody got a hold of this that could do something about it. A local reporter heard about the story, and I don't know how. Local reporter heard about the story in the next couple days, did some investigative reporting. Next thing, front page banner headlines about how recent DNA testing, you know, uh, identified a known sexual predator, a man with history of assault against women and children, how me, Ray Crone, was still serving life sentence after being on death row for a crime that I clearly didn't commit. It was very well written, it was very truthful, very honest, also quite embarrassing for the prosecution the police. I got a call the next day, I was uh, on a yard, I got called over to the counselor's office, he handed me the phone. It was my attorney, Alan Simpson in Phoenix, he said, Ray, how you doing today? I said, fine, just another day in paradise. That's what he did. He laughed. He said, well, what are you hungry for? I said, what are you talking about? He whatever's in the chat. He goes, no, really, what do you want? Steak, seafood, Mexican food, beer? What would you like, Ray? I said, Alan, what the devil are you talking about? He said, I just got off the phone with the prosecutor's office. They just got back from the judge's chambers. They're cutting the paperwork. You're coming home today. My knees shook. I couldn't argue. What did you just say? He said, roll up, Ray. It's all over. You're coming home. Four hours later, I walked out of that prison, folks, looking over my shoulder, wondering, what are they up to? <laughs> After 10 years, three months, and eight days of dealing with this system that I thought was about truth, that could be about justice, and it wasn't, oh no, I was real suspicious. But I walked out to start my life all over again at the age of 45, reunited with my family and my friends. And also, when I walked through that gate, I, was, I had the distinction of being the 100th person. 100 mistakes they made, I was the 100th mistake that they made. Somebody they were going to kill, somebody they called a monster. Somebody's going to be executed to find out later on that I was innocent. So there's a lot of media coverage there. A lot, of, a lot of groups all around the country was actually waiting for that number 100 to happen. My sister back in Pennsylvania, but Dickinson Law School was asked to come up there right away that afternoon to come up there. They lit 100 candles in memory of the other 100 of us. They lit up the Coliseum over in Rome for my release. And there was the media outside asking me, how, what was it like? How did you survive? How did you do it? How does it feel? I talked about the support that I had for my family, my friends who gave me strength through those times of helplessness. I talked about how I slept with the Bible underneath my pillow. I read it front to back three and a half times in those 10 years. And believe me, there's some tough reading in the Bible. Numbers comes to mind, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> a reporter in the back raised his hand. He said, well, Mr. Crow, given your faith in God, how do you justify him leaving you in prison for 10 years? <laughs> what? How do I justify God leaving me in prison for 10 years? How do you answer a deep soul searching question like that? I mean, my, my mind's blank, I just freeze and there's all the cameras, the microphones are all leaning forward. And there's nothing there. And something shot in, I said, well, you know, maybe it's not about those 10 years I spent in prison. Maybe it's about what I have to do the next 10 years. I had time later on to think about it. I was like, maybe there was a point for all this. Maybe there was a reason. Maybe this was something that I'm supposed to be doing. And believe me, I was perfectly happy being a mailman. I'd be retired right now with 30 years in. <laughs> I certainly didn't go to my high school guidance counselor and say I want to be a motivational speaker. I want to be an activist against the death penalty. You can put me in prison for 10 years so I got something to talk about. <laughs> and you know what, folks? If they can do it to me, they can do it to anybody. I'm not the worst of the worst. I didn't even have a record. Meanwhile, while they're, they're calling me a monster, the man that was doing, the man that had done it was out walking around assaulting children. So that's why I came to change my mind about the death penalty. It's not a deterrent. If it was deterrent, how come states like Texas still have anybody commit murders down here? All the people they killed? How come states that don't have the death penalty next to a state with the death penalty has a lower murder rate than the state with the death penalty? It's not a deterrent. Murder doesn't stop it. They go, I wonder if I get a death penalty if I kill them. Doesn't happen. It's not for the worst of the worst. I've seen them make deals with people, the actual trigger man, make a deal with him to testify against somebody they have no evidence against so that they can use him as a eyewitness and use his testimony to convict them and send them to death row. Because somebody's going to death row. That's how the prosecutors feel. It's a roll of the dice, what county you're in, what state you're in, what area you're in, whether or not they seek the death penalty. Now recently I just found out even it costs more to put somebody to death, costs more to carry out an execution from the start of the trial to the end of the execution, it costs more than locking somebody away in life in prison. And lastly, it makes the, the victim's families wait and wait and wait for that supposed closure until they finally execute a person in the name of your loved one. Taking somebody else's life is going to make you feel better. It's going to bring your loved one back. For all those reasons, I now speak out about the death penalty. But in closing, I want to leave with, uh, with two messages. One, whatever it is you believe in, whatever it is you stand for, whatever you see as being wrong, you can change it. 
you can make a difference. You reunite with other people in common faith and belief. Stand strong, you know, stand up and, and fight this system for what you believe in. Just my little handful of family friends back home fought the, the Arizona justice system and freed me, persevered for those 10 years. You can do it too. Whatever it is you stand for, whatever wrong you see, do something about it. And lastly, the message I want to leave is we're all going to have our trials and tribulations in life, folks. It's going to be some tough days. There's going to be some tough times. You might find yourself wondering, why me? What did I do to deserve this? Why go on? I can't take this anymore. Questioning what this was about, what this was worth. When you doubt yourself, when you think it's too hard to go on, I want you to remember my story. The other 137 other men and women that were exonerated from death row. Think about that. Find that strength, find that faith to persevere and hang in there. Because later on you might find out what the purpose was this was for, why you were going through this difficult time, this hardship. Because you're strong enough to endure it, because there's something bigger than you later on you need to do. Find that strength, keep that hope alive, stay the course, persevere, never give up. And good luck to all of you. Thank you. Thank Ray very much, and he's going to take some questions. I just want to bring this home just a little bit to Kentucky, so that in case you don't know it, Kentucky has had an innocent person on death row also, and he was close to your age. He was 17 years old. His name is Larry Osborne. He was there for three years. They wouldn't let him get his GED because they planned the killing. And our Kentucky Supreme Court, which is not known to be some kind of liberal bastion, unanimously overturned his case because he was put on there, not by the same kind of testimony, but by hearsay testimony that the prosecutor used and the judge let the jury hear. They let a tape of a dead person be played saying Larry did the crime and you can't cross-examine a tape. So he got a new trial. Some, he had good attorneys both times, but in the new trial, the second attorney was able to win an acquittal from the jury. So it's, this is real to Kentucky, just as it is in Arizona and the other, the other uh, 138 cases. And I just wanted to be sure we connected this with Kentucky.